Well, good afternoon, everybody, and Jeff, thank you for the kind introduction. I must say, this brings me home. I served as Deputy Chancellor of this university for a number of years and uh, sat in this chamber for many a long afternoon during our board meetings, um, and indeed a number of my colleagues who I used to work very closely with are here in this room today, so it's wonderful to be back. I did want to extend a special welcome to our international guests who are here with us. I've read a lot about you. Um, and it's good to meet a number of you in person today, and I do look forward to what you will have to share with us this afternoon. Uh, thanks again to Jeff, of course, to, uh, to Sean, to the team at the US Study Centre for organising today's event, um, and your ongoing commitment to working with our government on initiatives. We really do value your insights, which is why we've turned to you on a number of occasions and will continue to do so. Uh, your research on international education is incredibly important as the New South Wales Government builds the sector's profile, competitiveness and resilience, which of course is much of what the paper is about today. I'm delighted to officially open the conference today and of course we've got here with us leading experts on technology enabled higher education, the revolution that we're talking about. A revolution indeed that's been referred to as the uh, Gutenberg printing press on steroids um, and a transformation that is well and truly underway and indeed evolves uh, with every single day with the announcements we've had use, um, recently, of course, with UNSW and with UWA signing up to Coursera. I do look forward to hearing from Professor uh, Collar, co-founder of Coursera, of course, on the front line um, of the so-called mooc world. Uh, we have over four million Courseras, Courserans, can we call them Courserans? Yes, Courserians. 400 courses, um, 80 partners, and MOOCs like Coursera are changing not only how we think about education, but how we actually do it. Um, any revolution means upheaval. In fact, it is the definition of revolution, and the implications of that digi digital disruption for higher education are far-reaching. Universities are having to respond to the growth of high quality and low cost technologically en enabled higher education and of course face very fundamental questions about the long term viability of their traditional business models of place based higher education which is the experience that I had, in fact I had as a law student on this campus many many years ago. And there are a number of questions that therefore arise. What does resilience look like for a sector that's facing this kind of upheaval? And will the education sector be smarter, faster, more strategic than the music industry was about a decade ago? The New South Wales Government is committed to working with education providers to support innovation, adaptability and competitiveness. And for those of you who are strangers to our shores, uh, international education is our second largest export for the state. It really is a key to our economic well-being, which is why we're so proud to be associated with the report and to work with the US Study Centre, who do very good work in this area. We know that New South Wales is a leading destination for international students. The majority of students coming to Australia choose our state um, as their study destination. But we can take nothing for granted as a state and our competitive position can be quickly eroded. Indeed, for the first time in a decade, Australian international student numbers declined in absolute terms in 2012. So our ability to grapple with technologically enabled higher education is very important. The health of the sector and its capacity to respond to upheaval and global challenges will have impacts indeed well beyond our higher education providers in this state. One of the findings of the report, which has been officially and publicly launched now, um, is that government should get out of the way so that higher education and the sector in New South Wales can, can innovate. And indeed, I've been very proud to lead a lot of that work over the last two years in government for the higher education sector we have enabled universities to choose uh, the composition of their boards and their governance structure. Uh, in many cases, indeed in UNSW's case, to reduce their board to half its size, to be more strategic about the, uh, the future. And the work that I'm leading at the moment is to look at what are the New South Wales government regulatory 
um, overlays into the higher education sector in New South Wales and at what level is that overlay, that oversight, that regulatory impact appropriate and at what level should it sit um, given the current environment in which our higher education providers in New South Wales work. So what are some of the other things that the New South Wales Government is doing to support New South Wales higher education? In 2012, we established an industry-led task force on international education and research, and we wanted it to develop a 10-year plan. The key recommendation was to establish a one-stop shop to support the growth of international education in our state. Last month, the government announced funding for this one-stop shop called Study New South Wales to be established with industry co-funding and to be shaped by the agendas and priorities of our educational providers. They are the drivers behind the vision for Study New South Wales. If universities prioritise investing in research to anticipate the impact of technological trends, then that will be Study New South Wales' priority. The government's investment in the US Study Centre and this report um, that we are discussing today will contribute to the knowledge base for the sector to build its resilience. Study New South Wales is also tasked with advocating to the Commonwealth Government on policy and regulatory issues that will impact the competitiveness of the sector going forward. With Study New South Wales, we have the opportunity to identify areas where collaboration between providers make more sense than competition. Work integrated learning opportunities for our international students. Raising student accommodation standards or indeed coordinating an international student attraction campaign within and between sectors of our education markets. In essence, some of the questions we will be asking are what can study New South Wales deliver for the sector that no individual provider, however big and whatever its global ranking can deliver by itself? Is there scope for study New South Wales to bring universities together to consider joint investment in MOOCs infrastructure? And do the collective benefits of this approach outweigh the risks? They're questions we don't know the answers to, but we are taking on board. New South Wales Trade and Investment, I want to acknowledge a number of colleagues um, who are here with me today, in consultation with industry, has identified online and interactive technologies for education as an area with high growth potential for New South Wales. And study New South Wales will leverage industry relationships to support technological innovations in education. To help facilitate this growth, Innovate New South Wales was established in April. Innovate New South Wales connects small and medium enterprises, researchers, corporations and end users to develop innovative market solutions. And the program is currently evaluating a number of online and interactive technological companies for the educational sector. The New South Wales Government worked with the US Study Centre to expand this conference today to include technological innovators. And I'm pleased to see uh, great New South Wales technological companies joining us today. I note there are representatives from Smart Sparrow, from Smart Services CRC and Open Learning. I look forward to hearing from Sean and to the discussion on the paper, Disruptive Education, Technological Enabled Universities Report. While I think it is inflammatory to suggest that the education business model is broken, and that of course is posited by Clayton Christensen, it's a constructive starting point for thinking about the sector's future. As I said, music and indeed publishing and the retail sectors are full of cautionary tales for those who believe that anything is too big or too established or too respected to fail. So what will survival and surviving the disruption that is unleashing unmet and unforeseen demand and pushing education providers to question everything they do? What can we learn from the strong US experience in this area? And is there a role for government and for study New South Wales leading investment in research, strategic foresight or technological platforms? The discussion today, which I'm pleased to be able to share with you 
and the Disruptive Education Technological Enabled Universities report makes a very important contribution to a sustainable future within turbulent times. And on behalf of the New South Wales Government, I welcome both and I commend the report to all of you for your reading. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. That was, uh, that was a really wonderful set of opening remarks to frame the afternoon. Let me now introduce my friend, colleague, and co-author, Sean Gallagher, and just uh, apologize to Sean for the, the smallness of my contributions to a report, which is really the product of his thinking and his, his innovation in this area over more than 12 months. Sean. Uh, thank you, Jeff, uh, partner in crime. Uh, it's been a, a fun few months, in, uh, particularly over the last little while, in pulling this report together. But uh, it behooves me to thank uh, and to, in fact, to second and to reinforce uh, Jeff's words in thanking the New South Wales government. It's been great to have uh, been allowed to go around the track for a second time to come uh, to, and to deliver to you some of our thinking in the form of this report. And our report last year on multinational universities, um, while maybe not as sexy as MOOCs, um, it um, has made some impact and pleased to say that um, some of the, the recommendations that we made to the New South Wales government are actually now policy and uh, we look forward to working with the New South Wales government in implementing some of those as they come along. But this work, as I said, is a culmination of uh, several months. Uh, Jeff and I had the pleasure of uh, going to Hong Kong and Singapore and uh, certainly thank uh, Roland and Andy for coming here. And Scott, you're a veteran now of these experiences. And it's, uh, we, we lucked, as we'd say in Australia, we lucked in, but in the US you say you lucked out, which means we were very lucky in getting Daphne. When I contacted Daphne, she said, you know, my entire 52 weeks is full except for this one week. And your family was otherwise occupied, so it's fantastic to have you here. And I know that um, your meetings in, in Melbourne and Canberra have been uh, greatly received, and I'm looking forward to continuing here. This report you have in front of you isn't the final report. We're hoping today there will be a lot of stimulus and a lot of feedback, and we'll use it to tweak and to put out a final report. And I, you know, sitting right beside Paul Whoppet, I, I, he's a lot taller than me, and I know that we've underdone open to study in our report, so we'll certainly look at uh, making sure that uh, we have much more Australian balance in, in the final report. But um, I want my talk today to be uh, not so much a synopsis of, of our report, you've got that in front of you, but to, rather to, to be provocative. So let's begin. We see MOOCs as representing the greatest upheaval to higher education since the printing press. Now, that's a pretty big statement. In some respects, the, the printing press, as you will see in the report, we, we sort of see that as um, it forever changed Oxbridge. Oxford and Cambridge in the way that um, a student could actually read material before arriving to the tutorial session uh, with the Don. And also that material was a, a widely available to other universities. It really hasn't changed. The, the lecture um, tutorial system of universities has pretty much held uh, sway for that whole time. Uh, online version 1.0, uh, there was uh, some important uh, uh, outcomes came out of that. Phoenix University and uh, uh, you know the Open University uh, in the UK much earlier, uh, and as well as Open Universities here in Australia. But in effect, the same sort of format uh, still occurs. We see MOOCs as being like the the printing press on steroids. So in terms of um, and that's at least on two levels. I'll give you the first two. So it's through big data. So I, I think you're colleague Andrew Ning uh, said last week that um, you got more data on education than ever in the history of all uh, research done on higher education, and I'm sure that that's probably true. With big data, we're able to um, have the potential of personalizing education at scale, personalizing learning. And the second is to use that data to continuously improve pedagogy. So it's not reliant on how good or not the lecturer is, but we can actually continually feedback. We th see that um, where we're currently at, platforms like Coursera, edX, open to study future learn we, akin, we think that's akin to iTunes. And let me sort of explain this analogy a little bit further. And I, I hope that I don't uh, raise the hackles on anyone's neck by mentioning the word Napster. Napster was a really important evolution in the music industry. I, you know, I'll put the caveat right now that, uh, yes, it was found to be illegal. But, but, but what it did was it unleashed 
an unmet and unforeseen vast amounts of, of demand for consumers to experience music in a more convenient way. Napster, in the end, didn't uh, succeed, uh, partly, in fact, because it didn't have a, a proper business model, and, and iTunes came out of that. In some respects, where we're at, um, you know, the Carna Canopy uh, started, uh, you know, several years ago, and in a similar way, it, people realized that there was this vast unmet need. The consumers, uh, you know, students, everyday people wanting to learn and to consume education in bite-sized chunks. And whether there's some causality, but there's certainly correlation, um, uh, platforms like uh, Coursera have come out of that, and very much uh, likewise with the business model. A difference between iTunes and Coursera is that the record companies had to be dragged kicking and screaming to you know, provide more and more content as the business model became more and more successful, whereas with respect to Coursera, edX, our own here in Australia, universities, for the most part, are very much embracing uh, the opportunity and they're actually at the front of the curve. So let's take a look at some MOOCs by numbers. Again, a remi reminder, this is a snapshot of June and July. I'm sure uh, Coursera probably has a few more universities like 85, given today's uh, announcements, and 4 million Coursereans. Uh, that, that 4 million converts to 13 million courses actually enrolled in. But you can sort of see that it's really much a, a US phenomenon. Um, it, you know, the three largest MOOC providers in terms of participating universities, Coursera, edX, Canvas Network. Uh, FutureLearn in the UK, uh, they've kindly given us some information for our report, but they don't want to actually start until later on this year. Um, open to study here, has uh, 13 universities, but it really is um, very much a US phenomenon, and uh, you could do that uh, metric in various ways, but really Coursera comes out uh, as the leading MOOC platform. Jeff and I wrote an opinion piece a few weeks ago uh, saying that uh, it won't be long before we see that there's going to be a MOOC Global League table. And the reason, uh, was sort of the, the, the cute little hook that we used was size um, Gangnam style video, which has had over a billion views. And that's been driven by popularity. And MOOCs is likewise driven by popularity. I understand, you know, Coursera doesn't want to release commercial and confidence information, but it probably won't be long before, you know, universities that are already doing saying, we've got a MOOC that's got 300,000 students. And eventually that actually might start to drive some of the market dynamics. And, uh, you know, eventually students might come to a university and say, what's your most popular MOOC? Or don't you have a, you know, how do you compare with others? Uh, we sort of see this as heading along. 13 out of the top 20 universities are from the United States. Interestingly, number three is from Spain, and uh, Melbourne University rounds out the top 20 with uh, seven MOOCs that uh, it is uh, now uh, has available on the uh, Coursera platform. MOOCs by discipline, this is a, an interesting um, outtake. Most of you uh, are engaged in this stuff, so it's probably not new to you, but uh, the person on the street might think that uh, using technology, it's a lot of uh, zeros and ones in terms of right and wrong answers, but um, roughly 50% of the uh, courses on MOOCs around the world are humanities and social science based. So, you know, subjective answers, uh, whereas 50% are in the STEMs. And, and who would have thought that uh, education, there are more MOOCs on education than there are in maths and stats, for example. That's uh, based on our efforts in trawling all of the websites that we possibly could and just uh, doing a simple tally. That doesn't say the number of students taking it, but nonetheless, they're the number of courses available. One of the things that uh, Coursera has learned throughout that time uh, and why humanities and social sciences are starting to take off is through uh, using social platforms for peer grading. And the, the, you know, the, the, the light switch that flicked on for them was peer grading actually equates to peer learning and uh, that's helping to drive uh, the sort of non-STEM courses. Looking by country, uh, Perhaps no surprise is that India, uh, sorry, that the United States is uh, at, at the top. So roughly one in three students on these uh, uh, on these U.S. Uh, platforms are taking uh, U.S. courses. We don't have a lot of information. This was just out there, so it's just really much a snapshot. Interesting, uh, and but likewise, no surprises to see India, given the uh, large portion of English-speaking population. Um, Australia is sort of coming in there at uh, equivalent to its GDP size. 
Um, we don't have any numbers on future learn yet, obviously, uh, and uh, no doubt uh, we'll um, update with uh, open to study. The big country that's missing here is China. We see in our report that there are three technology-enabled university futures. These are already in existence. It's not as if they sort of popped up and we identified them. They've been growing for a little while in various versions, but we think that what's happening at the moment is a revolution that's really a lightning rod to uh, force universities to begin uh, making some strategic decisions about their future. And we see that these three futures are part of those considerations. They're not mutually exclusive. There'll be a lot of overlap between them. Um, but this is the way we see it. So the first is MOOCs produced by universities and aggregated by platforms such as Coursera. Um, I've, you know, I have, we didn't put this in the report, but the way I sort of see things is that phase one is being gobbled up in some respects by all of the big names. Harvard and MIT and Stanford and, you know, and Melbourne and, uh, and uh, universities, the best universities in their respective jurisdictions around the world. And they're all, uh, you know, where they're going for? They're going through disciplines. So, you know, macroeconomics 101 and chemistry and, and a lot of the basic units because, well, when you think of it, that's, they're, the, they're the leading universities in the world for, um, you know, those, they, they wrote the textbooks and which is why I think th this first phase uh, will be largely taken up by the elites. But I think there's going to be a second phase and this is where uh, I think uh, MOOCs will become a little bit more creative and that uh, there might be some collaborations and MOOCs will be start to become more thematic. And this is an opportunity, I think, for, you know, universities that are very good but maybe not at that elite level to start breaking through and to you know, leveraging their comparative advantage in whether it's disciplinary or other types of uh, expertise. Online degrees, this is nothing new of course, but what we see is that um, MOOCs, and it's not a causality but it's certainly a correlation is in our minds is that there is uh, MOOCs is fueling a focus on interactive learning and interactive inspired learning. Um, the two examples that we gave in the report, you know, Georgia Tech and Udacity's uh, uh, collaboration, as well as Swinburne Online and Seek. And I'm glad to have some uh, friends here from uh, that uh, partnership today. Uh, in effect, it's really about um, uh, being providing at volume uh, and lower cost um, online degrees, but with the expectation from students that they're actually going to have active learning. The third is hybrid universities. Uh, Jeff coined the, the term Prius University, which uh, Ben Waldavsky liked that one, so I think we might stick with that one. A Prius University, so this is really um, completely integrating technology on all levels with the, the university in terms of the student experience. The, one of the schools that uh, Jeff and I went to which uh, amazed us was the RMIT Business School. It's enormous, it's 34,000 square meters, it's uh, over seven or eight floors, and in uh, Jeff's observation, there's not a square or rectangle in the building, and all of the classes are decentered. You have no idea where a lecturer or even a facilitator might stand, and it's all modular furniture so that the students can come together in constellations of whatever size, however it's gonna work for their particular learning exercise, all supported with technology. That's the hybrid university. Also, I, we note that uh, University of New England has just launched a future campus here in Parramatta. And uh, our friend Andy Chun from uh, City University in Hong Kong, they spend, have I got this right, 8% of your annual budget? 7 to 8% of their annual budget on, inf on technology and its infrastructure every single year with the aim to renew it every five years. You know, City U is a smaller university, but it's wanting to break through, and this is where it sees it's a co uh, uh, comparative advantage. We see these as the three uh, technology-enabled university futures. But running alongside that is what we see as adaptive learning, and we've got some of the world leaders here today, uh, Smart Sparrow with Draw Ben Name. Um, and this is really taking a lot of the concepts of what we've done, but applying them on a much more tailored and individual level for, for teachers. And it's using technology to mimic what the great teachers do. So a great teacher will tweak and, and, and modify or even change track dramatically depending on how a particular cohort of students learn. Um, adaptive learning 
allows this to occur in terms of you know, uh, this adaptive feedback, in terms of allowing teachers to monitor their students, adaptive learning paths, because one of the great things about what we're learning is that a textbook might teach you a linear path from A to B on a particular concept, but there are many ways that students learn, and this is uh, one of the powers of this technology. And of course, ad adaptive content, allowing uh, teachers to adjust as they, as they go along. This is disruptive education. Um, and the reason I, we coined the term disruptive, and, and these are perhaps more my words than Jeff's, and while I'm not sure that we've quite crossed the Rubicon, but things are already happening. There's already disruptions that are occurring, in, particularly in the United States, which is at the coal face of this. D accreditation. A few weeks ago, Florida passed legislation and in the words of the lawmaker who sponsored the bill to break the university's monopoly on accreditation. Florida universities, the public ones, are now being forced to accept for credit any, uh, for, for pre-enrolled students, um, should they choose to, to take a MOOC um, if they are not able to get into Florida when they actually want to start. So it's, it's already starting to take the, the power away from universities in a traditional field where they've had a monopoly. Quality, MOOCs in many respects, just like iTunes, is a, a lower quality product. It offers maybe certificates and not degrees. It, a, a, it is attractive to a lower class of consumers, so students who would never in their wildest dreams hope to get into a Harvard or a Stanford, but can actually access it. So in, it's, very, it's lower quality in that concept. Um, interestingly, you know, a lot of the MOOCs have, um, you know, like Future Learn in the UK. Um, there are other knowledge organizations that are being uh, offering courses. For example, you know, the BBC is being touted or the British Museum or the IMF. And so side by side with the best universities in the world are non-university organizations, again, sort of blurring the lines in terms of who has monopoly over quality in higher education. Academics, again, this isn't exactly new with MOOCs, but it's certainly uh, uh, f you know, f fueling it. And that's some new classes of lay academics who are employed outside the university system, but in effect take on a lot of the grunt work, a lot of the menial tasks that academics would have done otherwise. Consumer behavior, as I mentioned before, this uh, unleashing of this vast unforeseen and unmet demand. We see that there are Three lessons for Australian universities and potentially universities elsewhere. Um, I've been a, a good friend of Jeff's and mine, uh, Peter Lang, uh, who's the provost of uh, Duke University. He has been right on the front foot in experimenting in, in every particular way for Duke University. They're a member of Coursera. They're in, they were almost going to be in 2U. Um, they're also looking at other ways to experiment with online. His rationale, his guiding... Uh, agenda is to experiment along the way and to experiment a lot because not all of it will work but in doing so you learn from making the mistakes and you figure out actually what works best for your institution. Uh, likewise the University of Washington is doing the same thing. Second is to focus on and play to comparative advantage. Um, it's great to welcome you here, Jane. And uh, you know, I think uh, Deacon has probably got it right in that, um, in terms of setting the initial conditions for the experiment correctly. Colorado State uh, was trying to offer computer science 101, and you know, you know, charging $89, I think it was, to convert to uh, credit and. They were surprised that no one took that up, but uh, why would you go to Colorado State when you go to Stanford or MIT for the same? Deacon, on the other hand, is offering a, a MOOC on uh, emergency planning, which is one of their core strengths in articulating into a Deacon degree if the so, cho so chooses. And lastly, I th and this is the, probably the most important point in our whole report, is that we actually don't see MOOCs as uh, the death knell to universities, but it's actually a great opportunity for universities to reconsider the value proposition that they place on on-campus education, on-campus life. And we think that this is the right point in which, um, you know, MOOCs can enhance that, 
technology can enhance that. The, our three university futures can all enhance the on-campus experience. Um, and that's not just the tech enabled, that's also in, you know, investing in, in experiential learning and producing 21st century graduates in the things that, that they want. So what do students want? This will be my last slide before uh, handing over to Daphne. You know, I've, this is a, a, a phrase that I've uh, picked up on and you've seen it in our report. And this is Jeff Bezos and he was asked, how has Amazon managed to continually reinvent itself um, given the continual disruptions in e-business? And he said very simply, continually revitalize your business to do that, you can't stop at what are we good at. You have to keep going and ask yourself what do our customers need and want, and no matter how hard it is, you better get good at those things. Well, it's a, a real pleasure to uh, introduce Daphne Kohler on, uh, at that point. Uh, she seems to have figured out a lot of about what students, wants, or what students want. Uh, Daphne is the co-founder of Coursera with Andrew Ning, and uh, you know, in addition to that, she's also a, a full professor at uh, Stanford, um, and her research interests are in machine learning and probabilistic methods to model and analyze complex domains. Perfect. <laughs> All right, everyone, please let's welcome Daphne. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure for me to be here, and I'd like to thank. Um, all of you for the invitation and for the truly gracious hospitality that I've experienced in my time here, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the project and about where we are, um, and I'm afraid that I've had some of my thunder stolen, but I will hopefully be of interest anyway. So um, this revolution started out um, in September 2011, uh, which is not that long ago. Uh, with a grand experiment conducted by Stanford University based on several years' worth of work um, that we had done on technology and infrastructure and design and so on for, um, uh, for how to do technology-enabled learning. And that culminated in the fall of 2011 with offering of three uh, computer science courses open to anyone around the world to take for free. We were expecting an enrollment of a few thousand people in these courses, but uh, within a matter of weeks, each of them had an enrollment of 100,000 students or more. And to clarify that number 100,000, because it's not a number that we run across in academia very often, um, the largest of these courses, as offered at Stanford, has an enrollment of 400 students. So in order for Andrew, who teaches this course, to reach that same size audience, he would have to teach his Stanford class for 250 years. <laughs> now, I know we all wish Andrew a long and happy life. But even aside from the impossibility of reaching that size audience by teaching on-campus courses, I think the real point of this is that by doing so, Andrew would reach 250 generations of highly privileged Stanford students, as opposed to the students from every country, every age group, and every walk of life that were able to benefit by having access to the Stanford quality education. So I think we all realized at that point that this was a moment in history that all of a sudden we had the opportunity to take an education that ha had up until that point been available only to a tiny handful of people and offer it up to people around the world at what is effectively a zero marginal cost per student. Because the cost of serving every additional student in a MOOC is closer to zero dollars than it is to one dollar. And so there is a tremendous opportunity to all of a sudden affect massive change in the world. And so after thinking about this for a little bit and consulting with, President Stanford, with Stanford President John Hennessy and others, we decided that the right thing to do was not to keep this as an internal Stanford project, but rather to spin this out of Stanford so that we could work with many of the world's top universities in offering education to the world's many people. So this is a relatively recent screenshot, not that recent, but... Um, but pretty good. Um, and you can see this is, the, this is from the front page of uh, the Coursera site. Um, and you can see the number of universities, the number of courses, and the number of Coursarians. Um, each of those numbers has, still ch has since changed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those numbers separately before we delve into the technical detail. So this is the set of US-based institutions that work with us. The 
four at the top are our first four founding partners, Stanford, Michigan, Penn, and Princeton. But you can see here many of the United States top public and private institutions, uh, whether it be the Ivy Leagues like Yale, Columbia, um, institutions like Duke, Caltech, University of Washington, University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin, and so on and so forth. Um, these are most of, not including today's edition, we didn't quite get to add them in time, uh, of the non-US universities uh, that work with us. My apologies, Ian and Alec. Um, so we currently have universities from Asia, Europe, Latin America, Australia, of course, Canada, and so on. We have, working with us, the number one or number two or both ranked universities in 14 different countries, and as a consequence, are now able to offer courses taught natively in seven different languages. So in addition to English, of course, which is still by far the largest number, we have courses in French, Spanish, German, Italian, Arabic, and Chinese. And, uh, and specifically some of those courses, for example, the ones offered in French, are taught by, in this case, the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, aimed specifically at students in Sub-Saharan Africa. So these are entry-level courses that are aimed at letting students in those countries work their way up into their first white-collar job. Um, this, the Spanish language courses that we have, taught primarily by universities in Mexico, are similarly aimed at the introductory level. And the first of those courses, when it launched, had, I think, 75% of the students who had never taken an online course before. So really hitting a very different population than most of our courses. Um, a brand new set of partners that I think are worth highlighting because of their difference is, uh, is the um, partnership that we've recently established with 10 large state public institutions in the United States. And here their focus is really rather different from that of our traditional um, MOOC partners that I mentioned on the previous slides because their goal here isn't so much the global footprint and outreach and so on, but rather um, how to better serve the students of their state. And so the focus there is on access on quality of education for on-campus and online learning programs, as well as on a completion agenda, which is really critical in the United States, where a very large fraction of students entering these state public institutions don't complete their degree within a matter of even six to eight years. And so how do you use technology-enhanced learning to improve outcomes for students within the state? And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. So that's the universities. Um, as far as the courses, uh, when I looked this morning, it might already be out of date. We have 415 courses. Uh, the, uh, we've already um, heard about the range of disciplines, um, that it's not just computer science courses. We have courses in the humanities, in the social sciences, in business, in medicine, and it's uh, not moving, but anyway. Um, so really across the range of disciplines. One category of courses that I think is really worth highlighting because it's different from the others is an initiative that we launched in, at the beginning of May of this year, uh, which is in some sense our answer to an, a fairly common criticism that we get where people come and say, well, it's great that you're making a dent in higher education, uh, but for many parts of the world, the problems in education actually begin a lot earlier than higher ed. They begin in elementary school and in secondary school. So what are you doing to fix those problems? And we have never felt that the Coursera user experience is the right way of teaching a seven-year-old how to read or a five-year-old how to sit still and pay attention. So if we want to make a dent in that problem, what we need to do is we need to make better teachers. And so in May of this year, we launched a teacher professional development program with uh, courses from some of the, uh, of the world's best schools of education, as well as professional organizations like the Commonwealth Education Trust, which specifically offers courses for teachers in the developing world, top museums like the Exploratorium, the American Museum of Natural History, the Museum of Modern Art, um, and so on and so forth, aimed specifically at how do you teach um, teachers to teach our children better. And uh, uh, I, I know I've, I've talked in, about this initiative a number of times with Gordon Brown, who thinks that this is going to play a pivotal role in addressing the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, which call for the creation of two million new teachers in order to address the, the need of getting every child into school by the year 2015. So the last piece of this, having talked about 
universities and courses is students. Uh, we have at this point over 4.2 million students. And uh, they come from every single country around the world. Only a third of our students are in the United States. The rest come from all over the place. And I'll put a little bit of statistics around that at the very end of the talk. I could talk for hours about the kind of impact that this effort has had on the lives of individual students. Students whose lives have been completely transformed by having access to an educational uh, uh, career after, after taking some of our courses, to a better job, um, as well as just having their lives enriched by access to this kind of education. But since we don't have hours, I'm just going to do a couple of anecdotes um, illustrating, the, um, illustrating this. So this is Raoul. Um, you can see him in the picture. He wanted to become a computer scientist, but there is not much computer science in, um, in Peru where he comes from. So he took a bunch of the computer science courses on the Coursera platform, used that as the basis for Fulbright application, is now coming to study in the United States as a Fulbright scholar. There is any number of students who have been admitted to top institutions, in, at least in the US and Europe, and I imagine probably in Australia as well, based on uh, having taken these courses. So this is just one example. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is somebody who took the, uh, the sports and society course in Nigeria in order to get uh, into, and I think has succeeded to, in getting to the National Sports Council in his country, in Nigeria. Um, this, is a ni this is a nice one because it speaks to the other side of the age demographics. This is a retiree from India who after retirement wanted to do something else with his life. And so he took about 50 courses on Coursera, um, used that to create a body of knowledge which he's now using to write eBooks, which are now subsidizing his retirement. So um, there's some really interesting examples along those lines. Um, let me, oh, actually this one's one of my favorites. Jose from the Philippines, who got an interview for a job that he really wanted took the experimental genome science course from the University of Pennsylvania and now has a new job evaluating genomic research proposals, which he would never has, have otherwise had access to. Okay, the last example that I'd like to give, though, is very different from the previous ones because it speaks to a different type of lack of access. In this picture, sitting on the right is Daniel. Daniel is a 17-year-old boy who have actually corresponded with him and his family a fair bit. Um, Daniel is severely autistic. He has a speaking vocabulary of about 150 words and communicates primarily by typing on an iPad designed by his father. Nevertheless, by doing so, Daniel was the star student in the modern contemporary American poetry class taught at the University of Pennsylvania and considered challenging even for Penn students. That's the instructor, Al Filry, sitting on the left. And Daniel said that for him, this was the first meaningful educational experience that he's had after a life of special ed, where really nobody actually requires that you do anything. If you just sit there and be quiet, they're happy. And this actually required a rigorous interaction with the material, and Daniel suggests that this actually is helping him overcome, to some extent, the severity of his disease. We have a large number of students who fit that general profile. Students who are shut out of traditional educational experience because of learning disabilities like autism, ADHD, dyslexia, or others, as well as by other health disability. Just a couple of weeks ago, we got an email from a woman whose husband had been an athlete, a businessman, and a world traveler who had been totally debilitated by Parkinson's disease. And his only window to the outside world is now the um, fantasy and science fiction class from the University of Michigan that he's taking via Coursera. So this is really opening doors to people um, who are shut out because of other reasons. Oh, and I forgot to say, Daniel's father about a month ago sent us this picture. You can see Daniel in front of his wall and behind them are proudly displayed his six Coursera certificates of the classes that he's completed. So. Um, with that introduction, let me move on to the meat of this, of what a uh, student experience looks like in Coursera. Um, so let me talk a little bit about that. One of the things that we have tried to do is to transcend this notion of open courseware, which is just a bunch of static course materials sitting there, and turn it into a real active class. So just like a real class, the course begins on a given day. Every week the students have material they're responsible for learning, and every week there's homework that they need to do. The homework is graded, so if the students don't do it, they don't pass the course. And you can see the effect of that 
simple and obvious intervention in this usage graph on the slide, where the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the load on the site. And, and, okay, in animation doesn't seem to work here. You can see that spiky heartbeat pattern. That's every week the day before the deadline. <laughs> every week, the day before everybody logs in to do their homework, which I guess suggests that procrastination truly is a global phenomenon. And then at the very end of this, there is the credential, and I'll talk about credentialing later on, so we'll get to that. Um, okay, so what does, the, uh, what does the interaction look like for students? So first of all, what do the video lectures look like? So here's an example of what that would look. Um, this is, I think, from the Michigan um, class. This is the model thinking class. You can see the instructor is talking. He can write on his slides. And then the video hits the yellow notch and the student gets asked a question. Um, the student answers the question. They are told immediately whether they're right or wrong and are given a chance to try again. Now, this is the same kind of question that instructors might tend to ask in class in order to keep their students engaged. But at least speaking for myself, when I ask my students a question, because I speak relatively quickly, as I'm sure you've noticed, 80% um, of them are still scribbling the last thing I said. The ones with their laptops open in the back row, they're not actually taking notes by and large. Um, and then there's the smarty pants in the front row, always the same guy, who, asks, who answers the question before anyone else has had a chance to notice that a question had been asked. And then I'm sure you've had those in your classes as well. And then the class moves on. Here, every single student has to engage with the material, and that really does change the learning experience in a significant way. The other thing that you can do in video is really personalize the experience to the needs of individual students. Unlike a lecture where everybody sits there and is all going at the same flow, at the same pace, regardless of uh, whether it's the right flow for an individual student, here a student has the opportunity to watch at 1.5 speed, which is actually the video that you just saw, or watch more slowly, rewind when they need, and so on. It also gives the instructor the opportunity to divide the content into units that are much more amenable to a student's attention span, um, units of maybe five, eight, ten minutes on a particular topic that allow the material to be traversed in much more comprehensible and personalized ways, as well as to allow flexibility in the curriculum, whether in uh, introductory material that some students might benefit from and others not, or optional material that's relevant to some but not others. Now, the video is only actually a very small part of the learning experience in these courses. A much bigger part is the assessments, the formative assessments that students have to do every single week. And, of course, this poses a challenge when you're doing things at MOOC scale because you have 100,000 students, but by and large, you do not have 5,000 teaching assistants. So who's going to grade all that work? So we put in place two answers to that question. One is to have the computer grade the work, and the other is to have other students grade the work. So talking about the first one first, computers are actually quite good these days at grading a fairly deep set of assessments that go beyond just multiple choice. You saw short answers in the video, um, computer programs, computer models, math, Excel spreadsheets, a lot of things can be graded by a computer. So let me show one example of this type of in-depth assessment that one can do with computer-based grading. This is from the Computer Science 101 class at Stanford University. The focus is to try and uh, color correct this image. The student is actually programming in the browser, and every time when they want to press run, the comparison is done between what they submitted and the right answer. In this case, it's not quite right, so they get a chance to try again. And in this case, they're correct and they can move on. This opportunity to submit and resubmit is actually one of the most powerful aspects of this paradigm that I think came to us as a bit of a surprise. Because it induces in the students this natural wish to game the system in the same way that they're trying to beat a computer game. So they try and try and try again until they get it. So here's two graphs that support that. This is from 29 Coursera classes that uh, enable uh, mastery-based learning. On the left-hand side, you see uh, the blue graph is the distribution of initial scores for an assignment, and the green graph is the, score, is the distribution of scores for that same assignment at the final submission, and you can see that students naturally gravitate towards achieving a much better score. 
Furthermore, if you see the graph on the right, the further away they are from, a, from an optimal score, which is the x-axis, the higher the probability that they resubmit. So again, the students who are further behind are more likely to try and do better. Now the question, of course, is does that help? Does the submission and resubmission actually improve learning outcomes? And so we did some data analytics on that very recently. This is a paper that's about to come out. And what you see here is um, the x-axis is the formative score improvements. That is, how much does the student improve by doing try and try again? And the y-axis is their performance on the final exam. The color of the dots correspond to initial baseline performance. That is, how talented are these students to begin with? So blue dots are students who didn't do so well initially, and the red dots are the students who were really good to begin with. And the point being that in each and every one of those populations, formative score improvements correlate strongly with better performance on the final exam when stratified into that population. And so basically, it seems that this actually does help students do better um, in terms of long-term outcomes. The second strategy that we put into place that also turns out to be quite valuable is that of peer grading. And that was put in place with a specific goal of dealing with the kinds of assessments that a, per that a computer currently cannot grade, whether it be open-ended um, uh, essays or design projects or a whole bunch of things that we cannot currently apply computer grading. Here in this peer grading um, approach, which is based on the notion of calibrated peer review that was first designed at UCLA. Um, the idea is that the uh, instructor puts together a peer grading rubric, which specifies very clear instructions to the graders on how they're supposed to assess the work of their peers. The students get that after they submit their own work. They all grade the work of five other people, and then the results are collated. And you can see that when the peer grading rubric is well designed, for example, as in this uh, introduction to sociology class from Princeton, there is a very strong correlation between the score that would have been assigned by the TA, which is the x-axis, and the score that was assigned as part of the peer grading process on the y-axis. I would argue that this correlation is actually as good as you would get between two TAs grading the same work. Now, in addition to the viability of this then as an evaluation methodology, this also turns out to have important pedagogical benefits. We are constantly told by students that they learn as much or more from grading the work of their peers as they do from doing the work themselves. Because they have just finished struggling with the question, so they really understand it and they really understand the trade-offs of different solution methods based, and they picked one, and all of a sudden they're now shown a variety of other solution methods which really helps show them that there's different ways of tackling the same problem, which is really an essential piece to creativity. And then the final thing about peer grading is it really opens the door to doing at-scale grading of the kinds of projects that you wouldn't think can be done within a MOOC. So this is the Wharton design class. Uh, it was an eight-week project class. And there were no traditional assessments. This was just a project, and the students had to submit first a concept, then a needs analysis, a pr prototype, and a final artifact. Each week they got five different pieces of feedback on that, so that by the end they'd gotten 40 pieces of feedback, which really helped inspire the construction of some pretty amazing artifacts as an output of this class. The final piece of the student experience here, which I think flows naturally from peer grading, is that of community. One of the things that we have leveraged extensively in this whole MOOC effort is crowdsourcing, the ability of the peer-to-peer -peer network to substitute for the lack of existence of a hub, in this case, a, an instructor who has the time and, and ability to interact with all of the students. So specifically, for example, as it relates to question answering, students ask questions, other students help prioritize questions by ranking questions up and down and ranking answers up and down. And then um, students answer those questions, and it turns out that students often give much better and more detailed answers than a normal instructor would have a chance to do. And so this really helps substitute for the instructor um, involvement in many ways. The other place where community comes in is it turns out that students do crave face-to-face -face contact and benefit from it. So for example, currently we have over 3,000 Coursera communities scattered around the world in different cities. They meet up once a week. This is from meetup.com slash Coursera. They meet up once a week in a coffee shop or in somebody's home to talk about the course materials, answer questions, and help each other over the hard bit. And we're told that this is a really critical part of the learning experience for many. Specifically, I want to highlight this one community, which I think is very noteworthy. Um, this is a 
community of people who are not among life's most fortunate. These are mostly women, minority women, in their 40s and 50s from a very poor part of Ohio. Only one of them has a college education. Most of them are unemployed or in low paying jobs. They got together under the supervision of this wonderful woman you can see her standing on the left. She's called Sharon Watkins. And she brought them together and said, let's take a class together. They picked the Grotto Greatness class from the Darden Business School at the University of Virginia. And they took the class together throughout its entire, I think, eight-week session. And the amazing thing is of these 10 women, as I said, who, don't, who are not college educated in general, um, 10 of them enrolled, nine of them completed the class, and six of them passed the final exam. So that's kind of a really, and now one of them, in, a woman in her late 50s, is becoming an entrepreneur based on this class. So that's kind of nice. Okay, so the final piece of the student experience is the credential at the end. So let me talk a little bit about that. So in the uh, January of 2013, so six months ago, we put into play something called the signature track. The signature track serves two purposes. It serves to give students a more meaningful credential, still not university credit, but a more meaningful credential recognizing their accomplishment. And it's also a sustainability mechanism, AKA business model um, for Coursera in order to keep this effort going. So the signature track, which costs a modest amount of about $50 on average, is something that the students fully optionally can opt into about two weeks into the course and say, I want to take this course in an identity verified way. If they do so, they submit a picture ID, which is compared to their webcam photo, and they create a biometric profile that uses keystroke biometrics. It turns out that if you type, that if two people type the same phrase, so for example, if Margaret and I type the same phrase, it's gonna look completely different in terms of the rhythm. And so I can't be Margaret and she can't be me, even if we try really hard. And so once we create that biometric profile, we can, have, we can identify that the student is actually participating in their own learning and therefore are more comfortable giving a credential to somebody who A, we know is a real person and not Donald Duck, and B, we know was actually there when the learning was taking place. And this is actually turning out to be a pretty reasonable business model for us. We were getting close to a million dollars in the six months that this has been running on a very small subset of courses. The other aspect of the signature track is that it allows us to refute one of the big criticisms that has been levied against MOOCs. So if you go talk to people, they will tell you, oh, MOOCs must be terrible because the completion rates are 5%, 3%, 8%, can't be any good, right? Well, the truth of the matter is, if anyone stops to think about this, which reporters often don't, is that most of the people who sign up for a MOOC never intend to complete it. And so the fact that they don't is really not that surprising. Signature track gives us a window into that because when you sign up for signature track, chances are you're planning to complete the MOOC because otherwise you're not going to get the certificate anyway. So we can use the signature track as a way of understanding relative to user intent, what are the completion rates. So here's two graphs on that. Uh, first of all, in terms of the overall population, um, again, depends on which subset of classes you take, maybe 5% of the students who take a MOOC complete a MOOC, but about 63% of the students who sign up for the signature track complete the MOOC. And this is averaged across a range of classes. If you actually look at people who come in and in an entry survey declare that they're highly committed to completing a MOOC, which not all of the ones who sign up for signature track do because $50 is actually not that much money. Um, it turns out that 65, I think, percent of the people who are highly committed to completing the MOOC do so, which is actually a very high number already for an online activity. Um, and close to 90%, I think 88% of the people who sign up for signature track and are highly committed actually complete the MOOC. 88% is very, very high for an online activity. And so I think this really speaks to user intent and it also speaks to the fact that having some skin in the game, even if it's only $50, actually increases completion rates. The last piece that I'd like to talk about on credentialing is this notion of the American Council of Education actually declaring that some of our MOOCs, five so far, are, um, are credit equivalent, which means that in principle it makes it easy for the 2200 institutions in the ACE network um, to accept those colleges courses for college credit. Now, for those of you who are familiar with it, ACE is the American Council for Education. It's an umbrella organization for all US academic institutions, kind of like Universities Australia. Um, and they have a program that allows them to declare credit equivalents for 
for classes that are taught outside of a traditional university setting. They assessed five of our classes, three in math, two in biology, and, f and now students who take those classes have the opportunity of having these courses count for degree if they subsequently enroll in academic institution. The last piece of this talk is about improving learning outcomes. And I'm gonna talk about improving learning outcomes in the online and in the in-class setting. So first of all, where do we improve um, learning outcomes in the, in, in, in the online setting? One is by big data analytics, which um, Sean already referred to. Um, so this is, um, this is actually really uh, an exciting moment because we do have a lot more data, I think, than anyone really does. And so what can you do with big data in learning? So I'm going to give you just, so first of all, let me just say, we instrument the platform so every single event is measured. When you pause a video, fast forward, drop out of watching it, submit a question on the forum, look at a question on the forum, everything is measured. Which means that you can start correlating things like if you stopped watching the video then, did you do worse on this particular final exam question, for example. So let me show you just one example of an insight that you can get from this. This is a distribution of wrong student answers in one of Andrew's machine learning questions. Each little cross is a one-off unique wrong answer. The big crosses, such as the one at the top left, is where 2,000 students made the exact same mistake in an infinite space. Now if two students make the same mistake, you'd never notice, but if 2,000 students do that, it's kind of hard to ignore. So Andrew and his TAs went in, understood the basis for the misconception, and now designed the response pattern within the platform so that every student whose answer falls into that bucket now gets a personalized response saying, sorry, you're wrong, but you might want to think about this. And that really helps students guide their learning towards a better outcome. Which brings us, I think, to one of the most exciting opportunities that comes out of this whole thing, um, which is based on, which goes back to a paper that's almost 30 year old, years old by renowned educational researcher Benjamin Bloom, who wrote a paper called The Two Sigma Problem. Bloom studied the distribution of achievement scores in three populations. People taught in a traditional lecture, not a large lecture, mind you, 35 people. People taught in a lecture but in a mastery learning format, which means that they weren't allowed to move to the second topic without demonstrating competency in the first. And people who were taught by an individual human tutor. Each of those interventions in Bloom's data gives rise to a full standard deviation or sigma improvement in the distribution of achievement scores. Which of course would be an amazing thing for us to achieve as educators. But hence the title of Bloom's paper, The Two Sigma Problem, because Bloom points out that as a society, we cannot afford an individual tutor for every student. But maybe we can afford a tablet. And if we can do that, then maybe we can re-ask the question of how can technology allow us to move from the blue curve to the red curve and ultimately to the green curve. Now the nice thing is that the red curve is well within reach because computers genuinely don't mind showing you the same video five times. They're quite fine with that. Um, and we've already seen mastery learning happening as in the ability of students to submit and resubmit their work. The personalization that you get from individual tutoring is of course a little bit more challenging, but we've seen some ideas both in the ability for students to watch at their own pace and also in some of the personalized feedback that you can get from big data. And I think there's a tremendously exciting research opportunity there for all of us. The other place where big improvements can be gained is in our own college classrooms. And for me, this was actually my entry point into this whole space, was in, um, is in trying to do, basically address this question. So this is a very, I think, uh, poignant quote from Edwin Slauson, a 19th century educator, who said, the college is a place where professors' lecture notes go straight to the students' lecture notes without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> Now, maybe not the most flattering view of a college education, but when you think about this, it might not be a completely unwarranted perspective. And so the question is, maybe instead of that, what we ought to do is this. Where students come in, into class having already used the online system to learn a lot of the basic concepts, the basic skills, practice them, achieve mastery, and then come into class to do this kind of active learning in the classroom where they really get to engage deeply with the instructor and with their fellow students and learn all those critical softer skills that we know are so important in 21st century jobs. So in fact, I think one way of really summarizing this very 
um, interestingly, is uh, based on this work that uh, Christian Turwish, who was one of our instructors um, from the Wharton Business School, who taught the operations management class on Coursera, and his last lecture is an, is an analysis of Coursera from an operations management perspective. Christian argues that instruction is, by definition, a trade-off along a Pareto optimal curve, where the one axis is faculty productivity, how many students can a single faculty member teach in an hour, versus student learning outcomes. Large lecture classrooms, the black dot, pretty productive, you can cover 300 people easily, learning outcomes, so-so. Individual office hours, great learning outcomes, terrible productivity. What Christian argues that MOOCs give us a new Pareto optimal curve that is strictly to the right of this one. And it's up to us as educators to pick for a given purpose and a given student population how we want to use this new curve. We can use that in taking an experience that is similar in quality, I would argue perhaps better, to a large lecture class and offer that educational experience to hundreds of thousands of people around the world at effectively a zero marginal cost per student. Or you can take the same effort that an instructor currently devotes to teaching in their in-class setting, and instead of doing that, um, teach with this blended learning format where you really get to engage with the students, and so faculty productivity remains the same, but learning outcomes go up. And so it's up to us to decide for a given population of students where on this curve we want to be. So my last two slides are about opportunities. And I'm going to highlight these opportunities by talking about two different ways of breaking down the current population of Coursera students. The first is uh, based on current educational achievement. As you can see, in our current population, although that's shifting, about 80% of our students already have degrees. Half of those have advanced degrees. Now, partially it's because of the inability to grant credit to most courses, which makes it a significantly high opportunity cost for students who are degree-seeking to take those classes. But partly, it's really because if you think about the educational opportunities that are available to people like us in this room, who have finished our college, our formal education 10, 15, 20 years ago, what options do we have if we want to learn something new? The answer is not that many, and they're not very engaging. And so what this opens the door is for people who want to continue learning throughout their lives, um, even while they're working adults, this gives a completely new and unique opportunity for doing that and basically serves a population that has currently largely been unserved. The second type of population that has been unserved, and I think the biggest opportunity for this whole endeavor, is highlighted by the geographical partition of our students. About a third of our students are in North America. 28% um, are in Europe, Third, about 40% of our students are in what's defined by the US State Department to be the developing world. And that includes the BRIC countries, but it also includes countries like Nigeria, Ghana, Vietnam, and everything up to the Solomon Islands. I mean, really a worldwide representation. And if you think about the situation for most of these people in the developing world, it's not a question of having access to a great education or a not so great education. For most of these, it's a question of having the choice between some education, actually they don't have the choice, some education versus no education at all. Because for most of these people in most of these countries, the existing educational capacity is just not sufficient to serve the needs of the population that's there. And so within a generation, or probably even two, if we stick with current educational paradigms, most of these people will not have access to any kind of education. So this type of technology-enhanced education at the kind of costs that we're able to deliver really offer us the opportunity to take education and turn it from what has typically been, until now, a privilege of the few to a basic human right. Thank you.